Revelation chapter 3 this morning, if you will, please. Revelation, the third chapter. Most of you are probably aware of how that when John was at Patmos, the Lord Jesus came to him there and appeared to him, gave him the entire book of Revelation. In chapters 2 and 3, Jesus dictated to John seven letters to be taken to seven New Testament churches out in Asia Minor. But amazingly enough, this book of Revelation being a book of prophecy, we've learned now as we look back over this age in which we live, the time from the, that Jesus was on the earth until the sound of the trumpet when he comes back, this age actually was prophesied, its spiritual temperature was prophesied, in these seven letters. And this age that we're living in is actually broken down into seven sections by the Lord Jesus before it ever took place. And we find these seven sections in these seven letters. Now, I can't begin to cover these seven letters with you today, so I'm not going to try to do that, but just to lay a brief foundation for it because we're going to look at a couple of them. Now, there's no question that you and I are living in the seventh section. The one known here is the Laodicean section of, of all of this age. And if you'll just uh, glance quickly and look at chapter 4 and verse 1, you'll see what I mean. Now, as chapter 3 closes out to the last churches that lay out of sin, and look at chapter 4 and verse 1. John says, after this, that is, after these seven sections have taken place, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. Now, if you know your Bible, that's the rapture. The trumpet sounds, Come up hither, and away we go. So you see, chapter 4 opens with the rapture, so chapter 3 kind of fuses into that. Now, this age, broken into seven sections, it starts off with the the church, is, uh, the church at Ephesus. And you'll find that the spiritual temperature in, in, in the religious world is described there, and especially amongst the New Testament churches, and the Lord has to reprimand them because they've already lost their first love, and it's only about 100 A.D. Now, as each new one comes along in this period of some 2,000 years, you never lose the other ones. They're always with us, too, so you just keep adding one, and the newest one is always predominant in the picture. So that today, as we live in the Laodicean age, the predominant thing is a lukewarm church. I want us to read about the last two. I want you to notice as we read that there are two doors mentioned. There's a door mentioned with the church of Philadelphia, and a door mentioned with the church of of Laodicea. So we're going to go to chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7. We're down now to the last two sections of this age. And to help you to understand that the Philadelphian age began in about 1500, the early years of the 16th century. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and then hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That, of course, is speaking of the tribulation period. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right, now, there was the message to the church of Philadelphia. Now, 
as we come to the church of the Laodiceans, this century in which you and I live begins to break because this begins early in the 20th century. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now watch verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Who that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now it's interesting that the word Philadelphia means brotherly love. It comes from two Greek words, adophos, which means brother, and phileo, which means love. Phileo, adophos, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's called the church of brotherly love. It's interesting to note that as you get into the 20th century and we turn to the Laodicean, where we find ourselves, this is the predominant one now in this age right now, which you and I live. Do you know what the word Laodicea means? Civil rights of the people. Isn't that interesting? You and I have watched since about 19, what, 50, 45, along in there, right after the close of the Second World War, begin this big push for civil rights. Isn't it strange? Isn't it wonderful how the Lord knew that was going to happen? And so it's the church of the Laodiceans, the very word, Laodicea, meaning civil rights of the people. Certainly we can see we're living in that section of this age. Now if you'll notice in verse 8, the church of Philadelphia was the church of the open door. Let's begin in verse 8. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door. Door. Now this is your period from about 1500 to 1900, right along in there. Notice in verse 20, the Laodicean church is the church of the closed door. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open the door, I will come. But the door is closed. The Philadelphian church was the church of the open door. The Laodicean church is the church of the closed door. Now let's think about those for a little while. First, then the church of Philadelphia, the church of the open door. Beginning along about the 16th century to the early part of the 20th century, three things that Jesus says to this Philadelphian church, which covers that age, 1600 to about 1900. First, I want you to notice that in verse 8 he says, Thou hast kept my word. You will not find that he says that to any of the other six churches. Now, to me, that is very important. The Philadelphian age, the 16th century to the 20th century, thou hast kept my word. Can anyone tell me what year the King James Bible was published? 1611. Isn't that interesting? Then the Philadelphian church 
That age, that era, was the one that published this book, and the Lord says, For only that era thou hast kept my word. Because you see, when we got to the 20th century, a lot of people began to push it aside. What year did the American Standard Version come out? Anybody know? 1901. And many Christians began to shove the King James Bible to the side and started using that perverted thing called the Bible, the American Standard Version of 1901, and that's when the lukewarm age came in. Now remember I said, none of them ever fades out. As the new one comes, you still have the previous sections and the characteristics, but the, the newest one's always the predominant one. Now, thank God, here in 1980, we still have some Philadelphian churches. But the overall picture, and believe me, I know what I'm talking about as I travel America and travel the world, the overall picture is the lukewarm church. And what brought it on? They brought themselves out a new Bible. And now what do we have? We have on the market in the English language at least 111 so-called Bibles. You've got the New American Standard. You've got the <laughs> Good News for Modern Man. Ha <laughs> ha. That's bad news. That thing didn't have a drop of blood in it. Took all the blood out of that one. You've got the Jerusalem Bible, the Anchor Bible. You've got the so-called Living Bible. And you've got the Amplified Bible. And you've got this long string of all these so-called Bibles. And the devil's not done. People are so confused. So which one's the real to The one that came out of the Philadelphian age. The Church of Brotherly Love. The church that had the open door, the church that sent out the missionaries, the church that, that did the job, and that sent out the preachers, and the church that went out and preached this book that was published in the Philadelphia age. My, we've seen a lot of changes, haven't we? Just in, in my lifetime, I have seen so much happen in, in the uh, Christian world, and I've watched the church of the open door go to the church of the closed door. He said only to the Philadelphian church, Thou hast kept my word. That was the predominant thing from 1611 and on. Now the predominant thing is a lukewarm church, stagnant and dead. The second thing that I want you to notice that he said here in verse 8, Thou hast not denied my name. I think of this, uh, this section of the age, the, uh, the Laodicean age, you know there is so much religious machinery in most churches, and I'm not talking about modernists and liberals now, I'm talking about fundamental types. There is so much machinery in them anymore that you have to wade through so much junk before you can get to Jesus Christ. This is one of the sickening things about the charismatic movement. You can't hardly find Jesus. Do you know what they emphasize? The Holy Spirit. Now you say, well, the Holy Spirit, God is not all right? No, that's not all right. That's not scriptural. Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, He will speak of me. He will glorify me. And when you find a movement that glorifies the Holy Spirit, and puts down Jesus Christ that is not scriptural, that is not right, and they have denied the name of Jesus. And I find so many churches today that deny the name of Jesus who claim to be fundamental type believers. The church of Philadelphia, Jesus said, I commend you because you have not denied my name. And you have an era when preachers preach and exalted the name of Jesus Christ. They did not point people to their movement. They did not point people to their own church. They did not point people to their own denomination like you see so much of today. 
But they exalted Jesus Christ and pointed people to Jesus Christ. And he said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, we know he's talking about the cross, but there's a truth there. When Jesus Christ is lifted up as the one and only way of salvation, he's going to draw people unto him. And that's why in the Philadelphian age, you saw him lifted up. You saw, you read about it, you read about great revivals like we've not seen in the Odyssey age. You read of the great movements of God, the great movements of the Holy Spirit that we've never seen in this of sin age. Because they preached Jesus Christ and exalted him and lifted him high. The, the Philadelphian age gave us, gave us great preachers like Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, who preached over there in Enfield, Connecticut, on sinners in the hands of an angry God, and what they call today the Great Awakening started there in July of 1741, if I remember correctly. 500 people came to Christ in one service, and then the Great Awakening just spread it all across New England and down into the south from Jonathan Edwards' preaching in the Philadelphian age. Then it gave us great preachers like George Whitfield, Whitfield whose life was threatened so many times. He used to have to crawl up in the limbs of a tree to preach because they threw bricks and boards and bottles at him, but he'd keep right on preaching. One time George Whitfield was preaching, a man walked up behind him. It was an outdoor meeting, walked up behind him and aimed a gun, gun at his head. He said, you quit preaching Jesus Christ, Whitfield, or I'm going to kill you. Whitfield turned around and said, pull your trigger, buddy, I'm going to preach Jesus. The man pulled the trigger and the gun blew up and blew his hand off. Oh, exciting age, huh? <laughs> The other third open age, the church of the open door was the one that gave us preachers like Charles Finney and Dwight Moody. I think of Moody so often. But there was a man, a, a very educated man. Moody was not educated. I, I don't know. He didn't get through back to fourth or fifth grade. But he had the power of the Spirit of God on him. And Moody preached a sermon one night, and there were all, oh, well over 100 people saved in one service. And a man came up to him afterwards and said, Mr. Moody, I counted 84 grammatical errors that you made in your sermon. Mr. Moody said, did you count how many came forward and got saved? <laughs> and Mr. Moody just stuck his tongue and said, see that? And then I said, yeah. He said, I'm using mine for the glory of God, even though I make grammatical errors. What are you, make? What are you using yours for? The Philadelphia made greatest great preachers like Charles Haddon Spurgeon, whose influence today is still predominant in the lives, especially of Baptist preachers who read his books. Spurgeon has, has had a great impression upon my own life. I believe I own just about everything that he ever printed. It was the Philadelphia age that gave us these great men, great movements of God. Gave us Billy Sunday. I like old Billy Sunday. I be, I'm looking forward to meeting him in heaven. He's my kind of guy. Boy, I mean, he, got, he called sin what it was. I like what he used to say about sin. He'd get up, you know, and he'd peel down to his long underwear when he preached. He'd, he'd get, they didn't have air conditioning those days. He'd be up there, and he, well, you know, he kept his pants on, but I mean, <laughs> but he'd see just his, his long underwear. And old, old Billy, he'd break chairs, and, and I, boy, I mean, he preached, boy. And he'd get up and he'd say, I hate sin, and I'm going to fight sin. He said, I'll fight sin until my teeth fall out. I'll fight sin till my fists fall off. I'll fight sin till my feet fall off. He said, now listen, as long as I got him, I'm going to kick it, punch it, and mash on it. And then he said, when I get old and toothless and fistless and footless, then he said, I'll just build it till it goes home to perdition and I go home to glory. That's my kind of guy. The third heaven age that gave us, that is Sunday. George Truett, great Baptist preacher down in Texas that God used so much to stir revival like a gypsy smith. Great men of God, great movements of the Holy Spirit. Men who preached this A.D. 1611 as the word of God. Jesus said, Thou hast not denied my name. Thou hast kept my word. They exalted Jesus. They brought souls to Jesus. They lifted up the name of Jesus. And that's why it was the church of the open door. They went out that door to go after lost sinners and bring them to him. And then I want you to notice in the latter part of verse 9, to that Philadelphian church, he said, I have loved thee. Yes, he loved that Philadelphian church. The church that doesn't deny his name. The church that does keep his word. The church that does have the open door and fight sin and win souls and sends out missionaries. I'm glad, like I said, there are still some Philadelphian churches in this day out of sin age. 
But for the most part, folks, this isn't the case. As I travel this land, I see so much lukewarmness, so much deadness in so many Baptist churches. It was the third orphan age that gave us great missionaries like David Livingston, Adoniram Judson, William Carey, David Brainerd. How many can you name today missionaries that stand out, that they're having such a punch the whole world hears about them? Not like we were seeing in the Philadelphia Elkin age, are we? Oh, God help us that we might be like that Philadelphian church and have the open door. Look for a minute again at the Laodicean church in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Now, to that church with the closed door, look at verse 15 and 16, what Jesus says to him. I know thou, thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. There is the picture of the average fundamental type church. I'm not talking about modernists. The average fundamental type church in the world today. You see, it's close enough to God to be warmed by the Bible, but far enough from God to be chilled by the world. And so it's neither cold nor hot. It's lukewarm. And you'll notice that they boast about their riches. Verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Boy, isn't this the picture today? The picture today is a closed door. Not people going out of their doors to win souls and bring, bring people to Christ, but all wrapped up in their little composite situation with a closed door. And Jesus Christ is standing outside. They've thrown him out. He is gone. He is outside the door. And they haven't even missed him. They didn't even know he was gone. The average church today, that's just exactly the way it is. They have no more power of the Holy Spirit than those pillars standing there do. And, and the Lord is out, and they haven't even missed him. they got their machinery so well on, and everything's so well machined and so well organized, but no soul in No little babies being born at all. He's outside the door, banging on that closed door, trying to get in. I see so much of it today. I see fundamental Baptist churches going that direction today. All kinds of seminars. They're seminar and they're people to death. Seminar, 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 this seminar, that seminar, the other seminar. I got to go to a seminar once every 10 or 12 years. <laughs> Good night. All these seminars, they to learn how to, how to do this, do that, and everything, and the world out there is going to hell. All wrapped up in these counseling programs. Oh, we're going to counsel, we're going to counsel, 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 and while the world goes to hell, we're sitting around counseling each other. I'm not against counseling if somebody really needs it, but people get wrapped up in this, and they get their little counseling clubs, and they have their little devotional times, and while the world goes to hell, they're having their seminars and their counseling. And if the devil can't get a Baptist church on that, he'll get them on Calvinism. I hate Calvinism with a purple passion. If you don't know what I mean by that, it's a simple thing. This guy Calvin taught he was a Presbyterian that murdered Baptists. Why any Baptist would want to be called a Calvinist, I'll never know. But John Calvin says everything is predestinated, foreordained, and set in concrete before the foundation of the world. Whoever's going to get saved is going to get saved, and nobody else could get saved if they wanted to, so there's no reason to knock on doors, no reason to witness, no reason to have bus programs, no reason to go after souls, because whoever's going to get saved is going to get saved anyhow. Just sit down and twirl your thumb. And that has crept into Baptist churches across this land, and they're sitting there dying on the vine, saying that it was predestinated that that's the way it's supposed to be. No way. You see, that's the church with the closed door. All wrapped in sitting in their seminars, the door's closed. All wrapped in sitting around and, and saying that what's going to happen is going to happen, so we'll just sit here and let it happen. So the door is closed, and the world's going to hell. No soul in it. They've slammed the door. Jesus is outside, and they haven't even missed him. And yet, they're the very ones who will rail at the moderns. Oh, those dirty, wicked moderns. Those rotten, no good liberals. Now, you tell me, what's the difference between a fundamental Baptist church who is so straight on its doctrine that doesn't win souls and lets the world go to hell? Now, what's the difference between that kind of a Baptist church 
And a modernist church that doesn't win souls, they make the world go to hell. What's the difference? Oh, we're fundamental. So what? What good does it do? If all you are is fundamental, and you can dot your eyes and cross your teeth and let the world go to hell, then you know better than a modernist that, that uh, lets the world go to hell. The folks of this church, you need to make up your mind. Oh, we want to be a Philadelphia church. Now listen, your pastor can't do that all by himself. It's up to the people to see that the door stays open. And that you keep going after souls, going out that open door, going after souls, sending out missionaries, watching young men of your midst being called to the ministry, and God taking them out as missionaries and pastors and evangelists and, and doing the work. Now, that's the church of the open door. That's the one that has not denied the name of Jesus. That's the one that has kept his word. That's the one that he said, I have loved thee. Oh, how we need to be on fire, to keep the door open. And to stand by his word, to not deny his name, and keep on winning souls, and keep soul winning the heartbeat and the thrust and the very last line of your church, lest it become a layout of sin type. Lukewarm that the Lord has to spew out of his mouth, and the members will have to stand at the judgment seat of Christ ashamed that they were a layout of sin church rather than a Philadelphian church with an open door and the blessings of God, and preaching the word, and winning souls. It's up to you folks. If you're going to keep it a Philadelphian church, it's up to every one of you to do it.